Welcome to Ferment Radio, a podcast series on bacterial and social fermentation. Fermentation can incite social action, spark creativity, and bring surprising new tastes to our lives. My name is Aga Pokrywka, and I invite you to join us in a conversation on living interconnectivities, from macro to micro, from societal to cellular, and from global to personal. Dogs vomit, moon shit, denon dropping, snake poo. These are only a few names of certain types of slime mold. One of the most unusual and under-researched life forms on Earth. They can be found on every continent, but since they are not really useful or profitable, their presence has been largely overlooked by humans. Well, that was just before scientists discovered that even without a nervous system, slime molds can actually find their way through complicated mazes. This brings up a very interesting debate. What does it actually mean to be intelligent? Slime molds are neither slimy nor moldy, neither solid nor liquid. They escape all kinds of classifications. Could they be fungi because they produce spores or perhaps animals because they move? Nowadays they are considered to be part of the Protista kingdom, but that might probably change too. Slime molds are like one big cell with plenty of nuclei and they also have 720 different sex genders. In other words, they are at the same time one and many. Slime molds are really beautiful. They live in the forests, mostly in the tree stumps, dead logs, rotten wood and leaf litter. They are bright and multicolored but they grow in dark and damp places. These creatures are quite small and do things very, very slowly. So, in order to study them, one has to have the right equipment, like time-lapse cameras and magnifying glasses. But above all, you need an exceptional attention span and relentless dedication. Sarah Lloyd is this kind of a person. Sarah is a world-renowned naturalist, writer and photographer. For many years she has done groundbreaking research on slime molds, which she actually collects within close proximity of her own house in the eucalypt forest in northern Tasmania. Who is Sarah Lloyd and what does she have to say about herself? By the way, this is the first Ferment Radio conversation that took place over a landline. Hello? Uh, hello, hello, here's uh, Aga Pokrywka. Hello, I'm uh, happy to hear you. All right, that's so great to hear you. I know that you have an experience with identifying some even like a new species of slime molds. And I was wondering actually, how do you figure out or how as a naturalist, you understand, okay, this is slime mold actually what I am looking at. Ah, yes. Well, that, that, that's um, taken quite a while to learn. So after my um, interest in birds, I mean, from that, I developed an interest in all sorts of other life forms. So... I was doing um, a lot of um, surveys on birds and I was asked, these were like citizen science surveys, uh, monitoring birds in remnant vegetation in the bush and I, was, uh, I always had to correlate that with um, plant flowering times. So I got to know some people who were very into, into plants. I got to know all the names of all the plants around and then also from that I became interested in fungi but it was through my interest in fungi that I got to know about slime molds because slime molds are often talked about as fungus-like organisms even though actually when you really look into their life cycle closely they're very different to um, fungi. Slime molds, um, I suppose, 
some of them superficially look like fungi, but most of the ones I collect are only about two millimetres high, so they are quite uh, quite a lot smaller than most fungi that you, that most people would see in the forest or, or anywhere. They are different in a lot of other respects. So fungi are actually more closely related to animals. So the, the um, substance in fungi is mainly chitin, which is this, this similar to our hair and our fingernails, whereas slime molds are a completely different kingdom, uh, completely unrelated to fungi, and actually more closely related to plants in that they're mainly made of cellulose. And the, what I'm interested with with the slime molds that I'm collecting is the fruiting body stage. So slime molds have a, quite a complex um, life cycle. They have what's known as a plasmodial stage, which is the stage that moves about and feeds and is sometimes visible on logs and on the soil and on plants. Um, that's often studied in the laboratory and there's a lot of really interesting research about the plasmodial stage but my focus is on the spore bearing stage so this is the um, the fruiting structure that uh, it produces the spores for reproduction. When I started my study of slime moulds which is about 10 years ago I knew nothing about them so I was familiar with uh, one or two species that are quite large, um, but I had no idea about anything that I was collecting. And so it took me quite a long time to figure out the ones that I was seeing, whether they were rare or whether they were common, and whether I could put a name to them. And at the time, um, and actually still, there are, there are no uh, guides for slime molds in Tasmania, there's, there are quite a, there's quite a bit of research and work being done in the Northern Hemisphere and so all the books that I was using were from the Northern Hemisphere and they didn't necessarily reflect what I was finding in Tasmania. So it has been um, quite a, a long uh, learning process to figure out what species that I have found in the forest around home um, and whether the species are new to science. So it was not something like I, I, I saw a slime mold in the field one day and said, oh, that's a new species. It, it's taken a lot of time to figure that out. And in fact, the three new species that I have described from my study site, I first uh, misidentified them as uh, Northern Hemisphere species, and it actually took a lot of work, a lot of DNA research from a, a researcher in the Ukraine to establish that they were, in fact, new species, new to science and different to their uh, counterparts in the Northern Hemisphere. Could we say that there are some species in a, um, of slime molds in the Southern Hemisphere which are not present in the Northern Hemisphere? Yes, that seems to be the case. Mostly people think that they're always considered to be cosmopolitan, so the same species occur all around the world. Um, the first species that I, I collected that was turned out to be new to science was actually one, it, it, it's a very distinctive species, um, and I misidentified it based on photographs I'd seen of this, this species. The species I thought it was was collected in Costa Rica and it was known as a tropical species and because Tasmania is a temperate climate and definitely not tropical I thought it was strange that it would turn up in Tasmania and so I wrote an article about it and as a result of that article somebody chased it up it ended up going to once again to this um, researcher he was working in the United States at the time and once again based on DNA and some of the morphological characteristics of the slime mould, they decided that was a new species. So that was actually the first one I found that was a new species. And there has been another one, uh, one that I, one of the first species I ever found. It was very distinctive. I thought, well, it's very distinctive. I must be able to identify this just looking at pictures in books. And once again, I sent it over, over to a researcher in Spain and it still hasn't been, that one still hasn't been described. 
but um, we do know it's a, a new species. And it has also been found in New Zealand. So some of these species I'm finding seem to be also occurring in New Zealand. So there could be this Australasian uh, group of slime molds that aren't found in the Northern Hemisphere. You work and live in Tasmania. And what, I, right, yeah. what, I, what I find extremely um, fascinating in what you do is that your research is basically like, a, what is it, like two kilometers, uh, like That's a proximity right. of your house. Since you are observing something so small, like also how you keep uh, sensitive on, on you know, ever-changing like uh, stages of life of slime molds or maybe some new species coming out. Because you are watching the same la landscape, you walk the same paths. That's right. And that's when I started, I realized that they are very unpredictable. So you never quite know where you're going to see them or when you're going to see them. And most of the studies on slime molds are done by people, usually mycologists who work in academia. They might plan a trip to a particular location to look at slime molds in the field. And they might be lucky to find something because they're very dependent on uh, weather. So they, they often appear after a period of um, wet weather. And so I realized pretty early on that I was in a very unique situation where I could be here all the time and every day go out and um, find different slime molds. So I've, after 10 years of um, searching for them, I've got a fairly good idea of where they're likely to appear, and when they're likely to appear. So I, I've just made the most of that um, opportunity to keep studying them here. Slime molds can be quite conspicuous. Um, they often appear overnight or in the early morning, and when they first appear, they can be very brightly coloured. So they can be bright pink or white or yellow and quite conspicuous in the forest against the, you know, the mossy logs and and it's quite dark in the forest because it's quite a thick um, canopy of eucalypts. So that's, I, you know, I realised um, the advantage I had of living here and I, I've, I've, kept, I've kept watching for them. I must admit I'm not quite as um, conscientious in my searching now as I used to be because it uh, does take a bit of a toll on the body. <laughs> so searching under logs and crawling around on the ground is um, quite hard work. So you find them on the ground litter, you know, lots of leaves on the ground, but also on logs. But um, there are quite a few vines in the forest here, and they'll go right up into the canopy, and they'll have slime molds right up in the in the canopy. So they are they're found anywhere there's um, organic material. Do I understand well that when you were moving to northern Tasmania, you were not really planning to research on slime molds, right? No, well, we've been here for 30 years and my main focus when we first moved here was birds. So I did a lot of um, surveys of the birds and then I gradually became interested in the plants and the fungi and it was through that I just started noticing slime moulds and as I became more and more um, interested, I, I just searched more and more and, and kept finding them. And I, and I think what it indicates is that they're much more common than people think. They're found anywhere. There's organic material. And as you probably noticed on Instagram, a lot of people are finding slime molds now. I think possibly um, one, of, one thing that c contributed to this is the uh, ability of people to take good photos with mobile phones and also... The photographers are just, uh, especially macro photographers, are really finding they're just such exquisite, exquisite organisms to photograph, and they like that challenge. And for you, or like, um, what is something which the most fascinates you about slime molds? Like something which, which drags you to it? it would it be possible to, to even describe it this way? I think what's really fascinating is, well, first of all, that there's probably been on the planet for five or six hundred million years. So they believe that um, slime molds were originally marine um, and they pro possibly uh, colonised the land at about the same time as land plants. And they're playing this really important role in the ecosystem. They're breaking down dead organic material and they're also feeding on bacteria. So one of their main functions in the ecosystem is to feed on bacteria. 
and and recycling nutrients. So in doing that, making soils richer for, for plant growth. And the other thing that's really fascinating about them, of course, is the postmodial stage. And this is the moving feeding stage of a slime mould that's like a giant amoeba. And except that... Uh, so amoeba is a single cell organism with a nucleus and, a, and protoplasm. By the time um, several amoeba combine to form the plasmodium, it can have multiple nuclei, but it doesn't have any cell walls. And that's the thing that makes slime molds different from any other organisms. This, uh, this multinucleate, essentially cell this body just um, enclosed in a cell me- membrane and its ability to move. So they can move up to metres in a day and they do this by a process called shuttle streaming where they'll pulsate and they'll move forward for about 50 or 60 seconds. They'll stop for a while, they'll move back for the, about the same amount of time, 50 or 60 seconds, but they ultimately move forward and as they're moving forward, they're feeding on bacteria and other microorganisms, the fungal hyphae, fungal spores, um, algae, and possibly other slime molds. So they're, they're absolutely fascinating from so many different aspects. And um, this ability to find their way through mazes and, um, and, and how uh, researchers have used them to design transport systems. And uh, I'm often sent People often send me these stories, you know, they'll send me the latest um, story that's been uh, reported on about this sort of research. And and really, when you think about it, for organisms that have been on the planet for 600 million years, it's um, very easy to understand that they are very efficient at moving around and finding um, sources of nutrition. Yeah, they are so hard to categorize, right? Like throughout the years, they were changing their place in the taxonomy and... They have different yeah. stages of life. They have this, I think, very unusual feature of having this many nucleus in, in one kind of a body, let's say. They were originally, I think when um, Carl Linnaeus was um, devising his system of classification, he, well, they were thought to be fungi at that stage and they went into the plant kingdom because fungi were thought to be plants. And then they went into the fungi kingdom and then into the animal kingdom because of the moving feeding stage and then they discovered this amoeboid stage so the single cell stage and um, they're now considered they're part of the protozoa kingdom I think uh, amoebozoa, protozoa there's still a bit of taxonomic disagreement as to whether amoebozoa is a super kingdom or you know whether it's a kingdom or, or not or just a super group but yes they're, they're very hard to categorise and they have these different stages in their life cycle. So um, they they have amoeboid stage, <clears throat> but um, the amoeba have the ability to form dormant structures called microcysts if conditions are unfavourable. And these dormant structures can live, I think they can live for a very long time in the soil. We don't really know because they're microscopic and uh, indistinguishable from other amoeba as well as being um, able to co- to form a dormant structure at the amoeboid stage, they can also form dormant structures at the plasmodial stage. And so they have a whole lot of different stages in their life cycle. And the other thing about um, my research, I suppose, that makes it so interesting is that almost all the research ab- about slime moulds is undergone in the laboratory because some of the species um, do well in a herbarium or, uh, sorry, an aquarium or just petri dishes, and they feed them on um, bacteria or rolled oats. And so a lot of the information that we read about slime molds is based on very artificial conditions. And what I'm doing, of course, is studying them in the field and um, trying to get a sense of where they operate in the field, which is obviously very difficult to do because they have so many parts of their life cycle that are completely invisible to us. I was also thinking about this, um, what we've been talking about just a couple of minutes ago, about this difficulty of uh, classifying um, 
slime molds is also like maybe the limitation of the this kind of a classification itself and then i was also thinking how so we also mentioned about this um, ability of slime molds to figure out their path in the maze and and which was i don't know so popular some some years ago i guess uh, on the internet all those articles yeah. And interestingly, this was the biggest surprise because they are kind of brainless and look they look very basic. Maybe this also questioned like, so what does it mean also the intelligence? Do you need to have a brain for that and how your nervous system should be developed? Yes, I mean, these are really unanswerable questions. On the, the plasmodial stage of the slime mold and figuring out that they can find their way around to find food, which is something that you can understand. It's an organism that's been successful on the planet for 600 million years but this notion that they can also pass on information to other plasmodia that have separated from them and then it's something that um, we can't really understand because we don't know how they do it but there is some sort of intelligence there or well, is it intelligent it's <laughs> it's interesting to ponder because then we would need to question what is intelligence right Yes. I suppose it's, it's throughout the whole of the natural world that there are these senses that we don't completely understand. Plants grow to certain places and, and shun certain other places, you know. They grow towards the light, obviously, but I was um, listening to a program about bean plants and how they're attracted to particular plants, but they might grow away from other plants. Slime mold's just another example of one of these organisms that um, we don't fully understand and how they um, transfer knowledge or throughout the organism. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's an unanswerable question at the moment, but interesting to ponder. Is there some particular, maybe even personal learning which you gained through research on slime molds and through, you know, hanging out with them out there? <laughs> hanging out with them. I think um, how unpredictable they are, <laughs> the unpredictability of fly moulds. I was writing the preface for the third edition of my book. This was at the beginning of 2020. And I thought that I was quite familiar with um, when they appeared and where they appeared and what season they appeared in. And then last year turned out to be a co completely different year. So they're totally unpredictable. There's so many things I've I've learnt that I didn't expect to learn um, through this research about slime moulds, and still many questions that I, you know, it'll take me years to actually find the answer to. I think. So what what's the rhythm of your work actually? Is there some particular time of the day when it is easier to observe them, or? Yeah, well, they, as I said before, they do tend to appear. So fresh ones tend to appear overnight or in the early morning. I do tend to go for a walk every morning, so I just go for my usual walk through the forest every morning, and if I see something there, I will make a note of it or just mark it somehow because they're often very conspicuous when they first appear, like they're brightly coloured, um, but they do, as their spores develop and the fruiting bodies mature, they become very inconspicuous. So I tend to mark it with a piece of tape. Sometimes I'll set up the camera and take what's essentially time-lapse photos of how, and showing how they develop. And other times I'll just go back and I'll collect the mature fruiting bodies. I've got them and I'll bring them back um, to the house where I've got my microscope and I'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out um, their identification. And I so I have got a herbarium, a personal herbarium with about 2,000 collections in it now and I also um, send a lot of samples to the herbarium like the National Herbarium. If um, overseas researchers want to use any of my material for research they can access anything from the herbarium, the National Herbarium. So it's, yeah it's quite a time-consuming process. I do collect, if I collect species in the field I, I bring them back um, they dry very quickly, they air dry in, in an hour or so, then I mount them on card and they do last indefinitely. So if they're stored properly, they'll last for a lifetime. 
And in that respect, they're very different from fungi. So if you collect fungi, you've got to describe them straight away because they they shrink. Um, with slime molds, that those features will be there indefinitely. Do you have any like a favorite or special, well, besides the one you discovered, uh, kinds of slime molds you would like to tell us about? Yeah, there's some there's some really beautiful ones. I think the ones that probably are most popular are the iridescent ones. So the the membrane that surrounds the spore mass is called the peridium, and a lot of the species called Labradurma have this beautiful iridescent peridium. With, so you see all these beautiful um, blues and greens and pinks and uh, iridescent colors. And I suppose the other thing that really fascinates me um, about them is that once you get into looking at the microscopics of these structures, they're just exquisite in fact some of the tiny little uh, fruiting bodies if you look at them with all their spores blown out blown out just the bare structure and they're very like miniature trees so i look at these giant trees in the forest around home and they're very similar to these you know one to two millimeter high slime molds that i'm collecting in the forest it's a sort of interesting comparison this huge thing to this tiny organism with similar structure in their branches and, and stalks, trunks. Maybe it's a little bit unfair how slime molds are named, right? Because neither yep. slime or mold is really like, um, it doesn't sound yeah. very attractive, right? But what you describe doesn't really fit this name. I know, it's very unfortunate. And it was named, um, I think they got the name slime mold in about 1833 when a German mycologist gave them the name myxomycete, which translates to slime fungus, actually. So that refers to the plasmodial stage of the life cycle. Um, that's the that's where they have multiple nuclei, and they're just one, like one large cell. It's actually a very interesting structure, so it's full of food vacuoles, and, but it is covered in what's called a slime sheath, and that's like a slimy layer, and that stops the organism from drying out. Unfortunately, has given the whole group this unattractive name, when in fact they're very beautiful organisms. Next time when I go to the nearby forest and I would like to look for a slime molds, could you give me some hints how I should look for <laughs> them? <laughs> well, I always take a very strong light, a uh, torch, hand lens, you know, torch or hand lens or flashlight and um, I always have a 10 times um, little magnifying glass or loop. I generally shine the light on and, and the places I look most would be if there are big logs and where I live in, in Tasmania <clears throat> the forest had some logs taken out but there are big logs that were left on the forest floor and they're now covered in Um, mosses and lichens and liverworts and at certain times of the year they can be very productive and also I, I look on the leaf litter and even standing dead trees just just anywhere but it takes a bit of practice to uh, to figure out whether what you're looking at is a slime mold sometimes very small fungi can resemble slime molds so it does take a bit of um, practice And they generally appear a couple of days after rain. That's where I, when I usually go out. So if it's been raining um, through the winter, it can be very productive. Um, but it's, and so it's summer in Tasmania at the moment. There isn't much happening, but um, I have found a few in the last. Uh, so we have rain periodically through the through the summer. Well, certainly this year, firewood piles and any woody woody material that. Um, nice and wet you'd like me to find slime molds did you ever find like a species of a slime mold which you were not able to find again yes uh, well I have found one one or two species only a, once or twice so some species are really really common and I find them every year some species I find some years and I don't find them again for another couple of years and there, yeah, there are some species I've only ever found once or twice But it's taken me a while to figure out which ones are the rare ones. In fact, one of the first species I ever found was um, a beautiful iridescent one. And I, I was um, sending some 
samples to a friend at the time and he he couldn't find any reference to it and he eventually tracked it down and it was a species found in Japan and was supposed to be quite rare and it's actually turned out to be very common here. It reflects not just how unpredictable they are but just how few people are studying slime moulds. So I'm the only person in Tasmania who's really studying them regularly. Why the research on slime molds is so unpopular? I think I have read that they're the least studied of all the microorganisms. And I think the the reason is because they're unpredictable. So if if a mycologist who studied them in the field, because it's so hard to anticipate because it depends on the rain, then it's hard to plan a trip um, in advance to study slime moulds. One of the main re- ways that they're studied is that people go into the field, they'll collect any fruiting bodies um, that happen to be in the field at the time, but mainly what they do is to collect substrates. So they'll collect uh, bark off, off living trees, they'll collect leaf litter, um, woody substrate, and they'll take this back to the laboratory and they will culture it in petri dishes. But they have to be checked very regularly to see if any slime mold fruiting bodies are, are appearing. And um, it's a very time-consuming process. And actually, I just said that they're the least studied of all the microorganisms. That's at the fruiting body stage, which is the stage I'm studying. At the plasmodial stage, they're one of the most commonly studied organisms because that's where because people can keep them in the laboratory and feed them and watch how they move and behave. That's what's so fascinating about the work of a naturalist. To be able to observe and study slime molds in their own environment as what they really are, a unique and unpredictable species. Something you might be now wondering is why Fermin Radio made an episode on slime molds. Well, the phenol bacteria have been overlooked for a long time and they are very hard to classify. But most importantly, because of their own nature, they are capable of questioning human main paradigms. And this is what Fermin Radio is about. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again, or find previous episodes, please go to fermanradio.com. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. I'm always looking forward to hearing from you at hello at fermanradio.com. Fermin Radio is brought to you by Culture of Cultures and is produced by Super Eclectic. Thank you for listening. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Fermin Radio.